Hi, this is Rich Troxler, a.k.a. Rich Trox. This is the second of my View from the Beach series of videos on learning to read a beach for the purpose of identifying the most likely spots to catch fish from. If you haven't already done so, you should watch the first video of the series, Understanding Wave and Wave Action, prior to viewing this video. If you wish to catch fish on a more consistent basis, then being able to identify key structure like sandbars is of paramount importance when it comes to deciding when and where to fish. I'm always amazed at how many times I see people walk to the water's edge, spike a rod, and then sit and wait. This is the worst thing you can do. Fish, particularly predatory fish, don't do random, and they certainly don't just swim around looking for something to commit suicide on. This is the basis for the old adage that 90% of the fish are located in 10% of the water, and 10% of the fishermen catch 90% of the fish. So let's take a look at what you need to know in order to up your game and join that select 10% who catch the most fish. Where reading water and wave action is concerned, I'd have to say that the most obvious piece of structure that wave action gives away is the common offshore sandbar. Sandbars reveal themselves by the waves that break on them. This happens because as the waves approach the bar, the bottom rises, which in turn causes the wave to rise in height until it can no longer support itself and breaks. The remaining wave energy washes over the bar and reforms as smaller waves with little or no cresting. The reason they don't crest is because there is typically a trough or deeper area between the sandbar and the beach, and the remaining energy in the wave is not strong enough to interact with the deeper bottom. The smaller waves usually break right near shore. There are three main structural components that a typical sandbar system consists of. The first is the actual sandbar, and they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. The second component is the trough, or deeper water area between the sandbar and shore. These are identified by smaller, non-cresting waves that reform from the waves that broke on the sandbar. The last component is the cut, or deeper area, between sandbars. These also can be identified by non-cresting wave action. These components and how they relate will all be explained in detail. Let's first take a look at sandbars and learn how to identify the ones that will be most likely to produce fish and why. Most all fish relate to structure, and while this is common knowledge, many never fully apply this knowledge to its logical conclusion. Quite simply, not all structure is created equal, and frequently it requires the right combination of structure components and conditions to draw fish. Other times not. This too will be explained in more detail as we go along. So you walk out onto a beach and you see this. What do the waves and water action tell you? What I see is this. First, the breaking waves just offshore tell me that a sandbar is present. No great revelation there, but what's really important is that the sandbar, at least the backside or shore side of the sandbar, appears to be within casting distance. These are the bars I like to fish the most because the sandbar trough interface is a primary feeding zone for most fish. The reason for this is because the waves rushing over the top of the bar push small bait fish, uprooted mole crabs, mollusk spat, and all manner of small bait into the trough and right into the mouths of the waiting fish. The other thing I see from wave action is that there is a slightly deeper lip that runs right along the shore. This shows itself by the waves losing what cresting they have just before breaking on shore as a plunging breaker. Lips tight to the beach are another excellent place to fish, as many times the fish will run in circles between the backside of the bar and the lip. On a beach like this, it is very common, particularly at night, to find fish right on the lip, barely more than a rod's length from where you are standing. Here's another scenario that looks like the previous example on the surface, but is actually quite different. Again, the breaking waves offshore reveal the presence of a sandbar, and again, it appears to be within casting distance, or close enough. So what's the difference? First, the size of the breaking waves is generally smaller than the previous example, so they don't have a lot of energy to begin with. After they roll over the bar, they continue to crest quite a bit as they make their way shoreward. This means that the remaining energy in the wave is still interacting with the bottom contour. What that tells me is that while it appears that a trough is present, the trough is not very deep, or deep enough to be attractive to foraging predators. While predatory fish tend to get braver in terms of shallow water at night, they generally like a certain amount of water over their heads. So another key point to consider when evaluating sandbars is the depth of the trough behind them. A general rule of thumb is the deeper the trough, the better. Besides reading wave action, one of the best ways to identify and evaluate sandbars is go looking for them at dead low tide. 
When the water is out, many features of the shore and near shore area are revealed. Sandbars can change from storm to storm, so it's always a good idea to keep tabs on these changes by doing some scouting at low tide. Twice a month, the moon exerts its influence on the tides, pulling them way out and then pulling them way back in again. A low tide during a moon period can really expose some sandbars and give you the opportunity to get a good look at their structure. And while many sandbars can be way offshore, far beyond the reach of your cast, sometimes they can be located right near shore. They may only have a narrow trough, perhaps a foot in depth, but they should never be discounted. Other key structure may also show itself as well, so examining your beach at low tide is a great way to identify sandbars and to see the effects that wave action can have on a beach. The second component of a typical sandbar system is the trough. Troughs, and more importantly their depth, can most times be identified by wave action. In my previous video, Understanding Waves and Wave Action, I point out several times that wave height and how they break are key in determining bottom contour. This is very important, particularly at the higher stages of the tide. This picture is perfect for viewing how the wave action reveals the trough because the water clarity lets you see the actual trough edge. This gives you a point of reference for where the wave action changes. So what you have are fairly large waves breaking on the sandbar. The size of the waves means that there is a lot of wave energy present, and this is important to note because of how it relates to the trough depth. Wave size is like a measuring stick where guesstimating trough depth is concerned. As soon as the waves pass over the back edge of the sandbar and into the trough, the crusting ceases along with most of the wave. What this tells you is that the back side of the sandbar, where it meets the trough, is a steep vertical drop that is fairly deep. Not only is it deep enough to stop the remaining energy in the wave from cresting, it is deep enough so that the remaining wave energy barely reacts with the bottom contour, so the water in the trough is relatively flat. But there still is wave energy present, because when the wave energy reaches the shore, you have waves breaking, as plunging breakers, right at the shoreline. Conversely, if the waves breaking on the sandbar slowly lose their crest over a short distance, it would indicate that the backside of the sandbar gradually drops into the trough, and if they continue to crest from the sandbar to shore, it would mean that the trough is shallow, with only a slight difference in depth from the sandbar. As I mentioned before, getting out and looking at the water at low tide can be very revealing. In this picture, you can clearly see the trough line, and it drops very straight. The two people to the right are standing on the bar, and the two people on the left are standing in the trough. At higher stages of the tides, these type drops are the best of fish, as fish tend to hug those edges while looking for food. Here's a short video of a classic trough at dead low tide. This was taken very late summer at one of the places I used to fish, while doing some pre-fall run exploring. That trough stayed put until late October when a nor'easter filled it. Storms giveth and storms taketh away, and sand doesn't disappear, it always goes somewhere. So let's take a look at another video clip and see if you can figure out what is happening in it. This was taken at high tide, so it's not as obvious as the previous examples. Also, the video angle distorts depth of field a little bit, making everything appear close together. Okay, let's go over it again and I'll tell you what I see. Look at the first wave as it starts to break. Notice how at a certain point the wave stops cresting completely. Also, note the flat section of water between where it initially broke and the shore. This tells me that something is happening with the bottom contour. Now notice how the wave behind it is building. It then breaks and as it is running towards shore, once again all cresting ceases and you're left with that same narrow corridor of relatively flat water between the break and the shore. Even though the video clip is too short to show it, the same thing happens on each succeeding wave. What this tells me is that there is a fairly deep trough running pretty close to the shoreline. Based on the size of the waves breaking on the bar, coupled with the fact that the leftover energy of the wave does not interact with the trough bottom, I'd put the trough depth at around two feet, maybe a little more. Its close proximity to shore makes this a very desirable trough to fish. All that's needed to make it perfect is a cut nearby.
The last element in a sandbar system is the cut. A cut is an area or channel that runs between adjacent sandbars. It allows water that has washed in over the sandbar to flow from the trough back out to the ocean side of the bar. This happens because water follows the path of least resistance. This picture, taken at low tide, shows a small inner bar system with an equally small cut, but it's enough to give you an idea of what a cut is. This particular bar system would be very difficult to pick up during the higher stages of the tide, simply because the scale is so small, but under the right conditions it could be done. Most cuts start out relatively small and then grow over time as the constant current of water passing from the trough back out to the sea erodes more and more sand from the cut. Cuts can run from a few yards wide to several hundred feet or more. The cuts that are generally most productive for fishing are the ones that are deep enough for fish to be comfortable moving through and narrow enough to concentrate the fish instead of having them spread over a wider area. Cuts are identified much the way a trough is, by their lesser wave action or lack of wave action. Because the depth of the water is deeper in a cut, the energy in a wave has less bottom to interact with, so the wave does not build as high as on the neighboring sandbars. So sometimes what you'll see is waves breaking on the bars to either side of the cut, but waves rolling through the cut and breaking near the shore. In this video clip, which I showed earlier, there is a cut in the very beginning of the clip. While the waves where the video was taken do not cross the sandbar, you can see that those down by the cut continue to roll on through all the way to shore, where they break. This kind of wave activity is a dead giveaway that a cut is present in a bar. But a lot can go on in a cut. As mentioned earlier, cuts frequently facilitate the return of water from the trough to the sea. This frequently takes the form of a rip current the current famous for sucking swimmers out to sea. And rip currents, which are a form of soft structure, do interact with waves, causing them to break as if they were breaking on a bar. This is because the pressure of the backward flow of water acts upon the energy in a wave, much like a rising bottom does. So many times, you just can't go by wave action when identifying cuts. The cut in this video clip has a massive rip running in it. When a rip is present in a cut, you will often see ripples in the water surface. Sometimes you'll see the white foam left from crashing waves flowing backward out to sea. Many times you'll see both. When you're fishing at night, you can usually locate a cut in the sandbar system if it has a rip running through it, just by feel. As you are casting your plug, you should be able to note which way the current is carrying it. If you keep working your way down in the direction of the current, you will usually wind up at a spot where the plug no longer drifts to the side. Instead, it starts to dance without hardly even cranking the handle on the reel. The plug will stay more or less out in front of you, and you will feel the pull of the outward current on it. These are excellent areas to fish because you are where the bait and predatory fish enter and exit the trough. Cuts are sometimes confused with holes because of the similarities in how waves react to them. Both are deeper areas that run perpendicular to the shore, but holes do not have a trough feeding them, like a cut in the sandbar system does. To sum it all up, all sandbar systems are not created equal. There are definitely those that are more likely to produce fish than others. While any structure is better than none, sandbar systems that are way offshore have little impact on your chances of catching fish from the shore. From the top down, here are a few general rules to consider when scouting a beach. Sandbars that are within casting distance or close to it will tend to hold the fish within range and increase your chances of hooking up. Nearshore sandbars that have steep dropping deep troughs are better still, and if you can find a cut in one of these bars, then stay near it, as it is the best of all situations. Learning to read water takes time and patience, but it is well worth the effort. Many of the examples I have shown have very obvious structures, but most of the time the structures are not very numerous and the clues to their existence are not so obvious. This is where the trained eye comes into play. Like the old saying, in the land of the blind, a one-eyed man is king, so too it goes with beach structure. If you have a stretch of beach with very little structure, finding that one small sandbar or slightly deeper cut or hole can make the difference between catching and getting skunked. I can't say how many times I've seen lineups on the beach with no one catching except for one or two guys picking away through half the tide. And when I would walk to one of the guys not catching, they usually say something like, those guys got all the luck. Well, it's not luck. It may not be something obvious to the casual eye, but it's definitely not luck. 
If those fish did not move, then they were holding there for a reason. And nine out of 10 times, that reason probably has something to do with bottom contour and structure, no matter how small and insignificant it may be. And being able to discern the subtle differences in wave action may just make you a luckier fisherman. Well, that's it for now. Fishing is a lifelong learning process that never ends. So I hope you find this information useful. I will be doing a video on holes in the very near future, so stay tuned. My version of life is that catching fish is fun, but catching fish from spots you figure out on your own is twice the fun. That's my view from the beach, so until next time, be well and catch them up.